Today's the first day of class, so what I want to do is just lay down a couple ground rules, because even though I think it really is just us talking about the artwork, I think it helps for people to know a little bit about the format. Sometimes I have students say a few words about the work first, other times we just do a cold read. So if you're somebody and you're talking about your artwork, first of all, keep it short. I'm talking like one minute or so. Please don't give us the play-by-play. -play. I went to the art store, I cut my paper, I changed my mind, I called it, I don't want to hear that. Give some short summary, something about your intention with the work, maybe if there was something you really struggled with, if there is a particular question you'd like to ask the class, and then of course everybody can jump in. When you guys make comments, please make sure that you back up what you say. So if you want to look at the piece and say, well, I think that the composition needs more work, you can come up, you can point at the artwork, tell us what's going on. Any questions before we go? Okay, cool. This piece is titled Green Hand, pretty much based off of a dream that I had in which this was the scene. And right at the end, there was a green hand that slipped through the female figure's hair and like was about to cut her throat. And then I woke up and it was very terrifying. This is a six layer silk screen. And I chose these like really bright, abrasive colors. I feel confident that I recreated what I felt. Let's get some thoughts. I think the composition is pretty interesting with like uh, the light source. It was a little difficult to notice the green hand until you spoke of it. That was near the lady's throat. Just because you have a, the green column, that's the same color. I think the drawing of it is quite beautiful, especially the border surrounding the picture. This part or just the black line? The frame around. The whole frame yeah. around. Okay, what do you like about that? I like the detail in it. I think it's really beautiful, especially when you capture the plants and the flowers. The perspective of the room can be improved. I'm looking at the window on the top right, so I think you could go, could go back into that window and improve that to make that space more clear. I think that contributes to the feeling of being in a dream, that distorted, a little bit distorted perspective. That's what I enjoy about it, is that it really transmits that idea of, like, it's not quite reality. That window and perspective seems intentional, but I definitely see how it can be read as a mistake. It seems almost as though, like, you kind of skewed the perspective of the window to sort of fit the lighting in the scene. Your registration on this is beautiful. It's, it's incredible. Like amazing. I, I don't know how many of you guys so have done silkscreen so before, yeah. but the registration only gets harder with every color that you add. I don't have a lot of experience with silkscreen. It's actually like the only printmaking area that I never really studied. How did you actually make those lines? I used like a felt tip marker, uh -huh. um, the acetate, and then I went in again digitally made these lines more bold. And um, the this, same thing, this, this is not the same thing. This was not done on acetate, the outside. It was a previous print that I had, much smaller. It was just one sketch I did outside of um, a bunch of plants. And then I mirrored it, so it was double the length. On Photoshop, like, cut it and put it around the border as the mirrored version, printed them separately on different giant sheets. So this was not a part of the original sketch. This was specifically because I wanted some type of, like, illuminated border. Is the original paper, is it that grayish color there? Yes, the original color is this gray. I wanted for the purpose of this main light streak and then the white on the border to be very loud. I wanted the green hand to like kind of pop out a little bit more. The title is green hand just so you like go back and like, oh, that's what that is. Um, well, but I'm not so sure that you want the title to compensate for something that's not mm -hmm. working in the piece. Mm -hmm. When I looked at the piece, I didn't even notice yeah. that. I mean, for me, yeah. Yeah. the more commanding part of the piece is this ray of light. I mean, this yeah. is beautiful, yeah. so luminous, and maybe I'm attracted to this because of the simplicity of that shape, because a lot of this is so busy and full mm -hmm. that I feel like I'm craving a little bit of an oasis. I didn't even notice yeah. that hand. I think because it's so close to how the hair is drawn, do you think it's yeah. a color issue? Like maybe if the blade was a different color or is it a drawing issue? I definitely think color issue. Uh, yeah, and the blade itself is not colored like the rest of the hair is. I think if you wanted to emphasize the green hand more, you could like maybe lighten the line work around the hand so that mm -hmm. the like hand pops yeah. out more. I definitely, when I first saw the piece, I was looking at the hair because it's so beautifully drawn. 
the hand in comparison mm-hmm. is so light, like the lines are so lightly drawn, it doesn't have as much like oomph and impact. Your green hand is the, the title of the whole thing, but you have four other hands in your image and they're much more like immediately recognizable as hands. What if we reconfigured these two figures so that these hands were not as visible and then this hand really you have to direct your attention towards it just this point of view is somewhat awkward because Mm -hmm. it's a foreshortened view you have the hand like right in front you only see the fingers you don't see the connecting wrist or the knuckles or anything so to a certain degree the fingers almost feel like they're out of context like we don't see the arm connecting it it's going through the hair so i actually think it's a drawing issue Another thing is that this column is so regal and beautiful, but it's the same green, and yet this is sort of the main event, Mm. but the column feels so dominant. And so I wonder, maybe if the background was very muted colors, Mm. and you pump up the saturation in the foreground, because this is where the action is. You're already making a lot of the right decisions in terms of like the ornate detail in the hair, like that pattern like really draws focus. Yeah, it's sort of like a balance you need to find for yourself. Mm-hmm. And because this is kind of a more surreal situation, there's no reason that even like the placement of the hand couldn't be like even more like unrealistic. What do you guys think these are? Because I was wondering, like, is it part of the clothing? Is it bandages? I thought there are bandages because there's no other shape that identifies as clothing on the bo- two bodies. It is bandages. Okay. I want to hear from everybody, okay? There might be an opportunity to use the border because I just don't understand why there's these floor. I mean, I know it's surreal and it's a dream, but like if there's motifs of the hand, of the knife, if, there, if you're going to be in this like imaginative world, mm-hmm. it might be really playful for the viewer to like explore this piece. But you've calibrated the proportion of the, the gray and these thin, the ornate border like just so well. And it's probably my favorite part of the piece. Clearly we've talked about certain elements that are somewhat problematic in terms of communicating mm-hmm. the basic idea, but this is a very ambitious piece. I mean, just yeah. the technical part of it alone, but I also think that you tackled a lot of things. Like you've got the distortion of the figures, you have the texture of the hair, you have the architecture, the lighting, the border, the ornateness of all this line work. I would much rather see a piece that had too much going on than not enough. Because it's easy for us to come in here and say, well, hey, maybe you could cut back a little bit on that border, or maybe this area has a little bit too much going on. Whereas when I get a piece that not a lot is going on, this isn't enough to really keep me going. And so this is a good problem for you to have, is that you've done so much that the idea now, the challenge now for you is, well, how do I organize that a little bit better? Let's have you guys talk about the work first, and then we'll have Susan fill us in. The easel is not part of the (laughs) art, in case you're wondering. (laughs) I think that's something to talk about. I almost would prefer to see it on the floor. If this is like bundled up sticks, is it pinned to the wall, hanging up? You said in an ideal setting, you would want it on like a nice clean white wall right. as a hung piece. Um, we're putting it on an easel just yeah. because we're in a classroom setting. But is this about the right height that you want it up? It would be, you know, 60 inches in the center, maybe a little too high. A lot of people don't realize that the thing about a sculpture is there is a physical interaction that is different than a painting because with a sculpture, it's in my space. I feel like when I look at a painting, it's like this window and I'm going into another world. So things like, okay, is it eye level? That matters. In terms of material, it looks like it's made out of some form of fabric uh, webbing of some kind and styrofoam was like, either shredded or torn. It looks like beach debris. Netting that you would use on a boat, wood that's washed up, plastic that's washed up. Now, do you want me to answer any of this or to wait? Not yet. Let's just have people put out their ideas and then you can obviously respond to that. With the wrapping that you have, that yellow wrapping, the amount of tension I can see right now, it looks like it would be a lot heavier than like one would expect. There's also a lightness to it just because of that yellow, like the yellow wrapping around it. Well, I think Sophie brings up a good point, and that's 
this idea about weight and gravity, the distribution of that in a sculpture, which I don't think we think about as much in a two-dimensional piece. When you guys look at this work, does it seem like a lightweight object? Does it look like it weighs 50 pounds, and, and why? I know it's made out of paper, mm -hmm. and I know that it must be quite light, actually, if it's just rolls of paper and just cloth, but it seems very heavy. I think from far away versus close up, these are very different experiences. Sometimes I look at a piece from a distance, I'm like, wow, it looks great. And then I get up close and I'm like, that's what it's made out of? And it, it almost reveals itself too much. I guess what I'm asking is, do you like that you can tell it's paper or does that ruin the illusion for you? I love that I can see that it's paper. Uh -huh. I think it's an interesting, interesting choice of medium because I agree with previous comments that these look like pieces of wood wrapped together. And I really have to commend the artistry with me with the use of paper in this and be like, convey that look and it just makes me more curious about the piece itself. With saying that it's like beech wood, like beech wood is something that was like it was once heavy and then it got all the salt in it and it was in the ocean and so now it's light. So do you feel, Ailey, that the piece almost has a history to it? Oh definitely. Uh-huh. It's something that's it's worn and it has a story. I'm also really enjoying like the color choice in this mm -hmm. because yeah. Yeah. it feels very like deliberate. The bright yellow against the more like muted gray tones. Um, it feels like a very purposeful choice. One thing that I, I, I think I would have liked to see push just a little bit is possibly how you would have handled the ends. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. I typically see in a lot of sculpture work where everyone would be so focused on the frontal, but never really intimate with like what's happening at the ends of any form of like visual line. And so when I look at the ends of your rolls, I just see that it's a spiral roll, but I think that's a great opportunity for you to play with either color or adding another element. Well, I think that's a great point because I do think that people typically when they're looking at a sculpture, look on it straight on. One thing that Susan did that I think was very smart is make this a wall piece. Because when it's a wall piece, we know that we are meant to look at a certain part of it. Whereas if it's full out three dimensional, you really do have to make every single view engaging. But I think Keon makes a good point that if I stand at the piece looking at it this way, it does feel like a different piece. It does feel a little bit unfinished. The back doesn't matter because it's up against the wall, but people do do that. People do come up to this view and they will inspect it. Okay, Susan, let's hear from you. What, what is this piece about? What are you thinking? My work is about natural disasters and the loss of home and community. And it's more focusing on the loss of a feeling of safety that you have at home and the loss of your personal space. And so this is called For Sleep in the Storm, communicating a feeling of safety, and these are worn and broken. Maybe there is a feeling of safety, maybe not. The uh, paper that I use is actually Tyvek. You see it as house wrapping, like when a building's under construction, there's a white covering on it at one point. It's made out of little, little plastic fibers that are pressed together like paper. These are rolls of Tyvek that I then heated and sealed the ends here. I take the heat gun and run it up and down, and then the layers kind of partially peel away and melt away. You can cut it with an X-Acto knife. It's very easy to cut, but it doesn't tear. One day I dropped a piece on my space heater, and it sort of went like... Do you guys think that our interpretation is in the ballpark of what Susan is talking about? I personally kind of saw it as like a safe sculpture just because of how it's bundled and I think also the color. It seems like you're very mindful about these choices and like their associations with natural disasters and natural disaster relief. Using heat takes things out of your control a little bit, like you're dealing with like the chemical process, right? Mm -hmm. But for me, like when I first saw this, it was more about, I don't know, like a bug nesting. When you said nesting, I got really excited because I'm like, I feel like that really does. <laughs> and I think it's, it's something that's like an ambiguity about the piece that I think is really exciting is that it looks kind of like in the realms that it's man-made, but it also has an element to it that feels natural. I feel like I want a little bit more color variation. I wonder if the coolness of all these blues, it starts to get a little monotonous after a while. And I feel like if you could sneak in little burnt umber or burnt sienna, maybe that would highlight the forms a little bit more. 
I think this is a very emotional piece. I feel like there's such a fragility to it. it it's mm -hmm. somewhat ghost-like. It feels incredibly vulnerable. I, I feel like if I touched one, it would disintegrate into mm -hmm. ashes. I think that's really, really exciting. Let's do another cold read. Wow. <laughs> The number of different types of marks that you have in here is really phenomenal and adds a lot of depth in a way that makes me just feel like I could be in this painting forever. What's the medium of this? It's uh, acrylic, oil pastels, and markers. The use of layers in this painting is really fantastic. It really just builds up some form in the painting. I agree with what we said. I can walk in this painting to explore all the line work and marks you've been making in it. Yeah, I think some of the more successful parts are where these like hyper articulated scratching and mark making overlap on top of these fields of color, mm -hmm. which makes me feel like I can kind of reach around this thing. You left space to just breathe. Something that often happens when people are making abstract expressionist as work. There's a struggle of finding the balance between like having a system of mark making and having something be more free. In the bottom left corner, you're getting caught up in a system more than letting the painting inform what you're doing. I'm responding to the color and your ability to like mix and layer color and still have it come across very clear. Right around here, both in color and mark, it gets like kind of muddy. But couldn't you argue that that's an area of rest? Because I don't know that I would want so many areas of intensive color, and I feel like I, I sort of need the muddiness here to offset this. Well, it feels like all the colors there are kind of like, and the marks are kind of canceling each other out. Yeah. Whereas like a moment like the top, right? I really love because oh, yeah. there's a lot of overlay, uh, overlapping in terms of brush strokes, but you don't read it right away. We've talked a lot about the way the painting looks. Where do you guys think this imagery comes from? Does it establish a mood? Does it tell a story? One thing I hear a lot about works that are not obviously defined, like, oh, this is definitely a rabbit. People say, well, I don't know how to critique it because what do I have to talk about that's very concrete? You can definitely see the energy in the mark making of your markers. Based off of the colors that you chose, it's also very calming. There's so much about architecture in this and, and forming space. Kian, why don't you tell us what you were thinking with this piece? I was looking at a lot of expressionist movements, like uh, automatic writing. I am a very literal person and I overthink everything. And so this was uh, a good way for me to bridge into something that was a lot more expressive. I was sort of trying to borrow a color palette from a setting that I was in and sort of express that experience non-verbally. It was very much about the process. And so this is more so like a historical map of what I was doing to get to the explanation of what it was like. Every mark has a different speed to it. This white mark is so stark. I mean, you notice it immediately, it really calls a lot of attention to itself. And it just seems very spastic, like it, it came across very quickly. And I do think there are some areas that almost have a uh, nervous energy to them, that they feel a little bit agitated. What I like about this is it doesn't seem like somebody who's trying to lose control. Like it doesn't seem contrived to me. It seems like that was a genuine process that you went through. The variation of layers is phenomenal. I mean, it's so different in so many areas. Some areas it feels like there's 50 layers. Other areas it's like there's barely one. And I am sort of amazed that you're getting away with this. <laughs> Most of the time, you mention that. <laughs> I'm all over people about the wide of the canvas because so much of the time, people just do it because they were lazy or because, oh, well, I didn't know what to do, so I just did. But I feel like you meant to do this you were able to get the white into the painting without it looking pasty. White straight out of the tube, it's a very dead pasty color and I'm always bugging people like, put Naples yellow in it, do something, put some cerulean blue. This is like a white glaze that comes across as like a lightish blue. And then here it's like you almost can't tell what's canvas and what's white paint. And so I think that mystery is, is really nicely done. I do think about this as mostly a cool colored composition. 
but you do sneak in some warm colors. Like that peach is wonderful. It is a warm color, but I don't think about it as a warm color in the context of your painting. It seems like it's a very natural part of the language for this piece. This is beautiful. Is that Prussian blue or phthalo? Um, it's phthalo, yeah. I hate phthalo blue. And I love it. <laughs> and your painting you brought me to like phthalo blue. Yeah. And just, I want to say the scale of it yeah. is huge. I mean, I made a pact with myself. After I did these seven foot tall drawing, I'm, I'm never going to make something taller than me ever again. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what you did, but when I was working on these big drawings, I had to get up on the ladder. It was a pain in the ass because I could never see the whole piece all at once. I mean, were you on a step stool? Or? Um, I had it on the floor. I took my shoes off and I kind of just walked all over it while I went about it. Eventually, as the piece progressed, uh -huh. on the wall was where it ended up going towards. I mean, I think that was smart for you to make that transition because I would guess that on the floor, you have so much more mobility and you can reach different parts of the canvas more. I feel like so many people make work to make it big just to make it big. And it's not because the work actually has to be big. Like I went to this really annoying artist lecture. Well, I made these paintings big because I didn't know what else to do. If you guys picture this as a nine by 12, it doesn't work. Like it does not have the type of presence that it commands at this scale. Abstract work is not really like my cup of tea. Like I'm not an abstract artist. It's not an area that's like what I really crave and love. But I look at this and it's like you convince me in my head that you know what, there really is something here. And that's really powerful when you can get somebody to think something that they don't think and then they go, yeah, I love abstract art. It's the best thing that ever happened to me. I mean, that's really great. So your, your commitment to this, I think, is really impressive. This is a screen print that I made. It's two layers, and it's a sigil that I created. A sigil? Yeah. What is that from? It's primarily from Wicca. It's a symbol of whatever you want it to be. So this one is love and protection. The tradition usually to um, create sigils for yourself. Everyone can make their own. So it's not, there's not like a standard that people follow. Where would you see one or where would you use it? You could have it like touch it on yourself or just like have it hanging in your house just to basically um, emit that kind of energy to bring that into like your space. I just feel like there's a lot of empty space like here and here. Because I feel like it's a little yeah, bit we'll, we'll critique it for you. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you got covered in that area. Okay, let's get some thoughts. How are you coming to the to the love and protection point from the shapes that you've used. I go into my sketchbook and I just spell it out like love and protection, then I just cross out the vowels and repeating letters. For example, if there's like an S like this, I would just separate into like two half circles. And then I would use those shapes and curves to just like move them around. So really the basis of the design is in text. Yeah. So considering this is such a personal symbol, how would someone be able to read or comprehend what it is? Or is that not like relevant? They would never know what it meant unless they would tell them. Well, do you guys think that's a problem or do you think that's fine? I mean, I think people have very different ideas about that because some people say, well, it needs to communicate clearly its initial intent. And some people say, well, everybody just brings what they want to it. They can have their own interpretation. I'm fine with not knowing what the symbol is. Maybe that's just a personal thing, but I think there should be moments of the symbol communicating its feeling. Like if this is very personal, if it's love and protection, I would imagine it really small on the piece of paper. If it got a bit smaller and more intimate, it might help with the composition. I was wondering too about the connection of the colors to the symbolism. When making it, I just rearranged the shapes to see how it felt and if it felt right to me. It wasn't really about like, oh, does this look like it would be love and protection? I guess like that depends on its existence, where, where it exists, if that's in a museum or gallery versus if it's just in your home, like how you said it can exist or on a tattoo. At that point, it's more intimate and more personal. Would you guys see this design differently if it was a tattoo on somebody's arm? Yeah. Okay, why? Why does that change how we view and communicate with the piece? I think that a lot of the time the function of critique is like to refine something to be like for a specific audience. Are you sort of questioning who this is made for? Like yeah. who is the target audience? Yeah. Is it meant to be a universally looked at piece or if this is a more intimate piece that maybe you just keep to yourself. Yeah, I think that's an important prerequisite is to just define like 
who is this for? I'm really in my head a lot. So during this process, I was just thinking about like how I felt, like how I liked it. I would definitely share this with like close friends. It wouldn't be shared with like a larger audience. Well, that's very different than say just a bunch of people who are maybe not in that spiritual community. So I think this idea of who is my audience is very important. And you think about things like, for example, public art, okay? A piece of artwork that's just sitting on the streets in Manhattan has a very different audience than people who go into an art gallery or a museum. Who is the audience? What is the context? Long term, it's something you guys want to keep in mind because in the future, you probably won't be making work for your peers. You probably will be talking about different communities. Is this like run-of-the-mill red construction paper? I have no idea. I just okay. It, it seems like it. I wonder if the red is a little bit too overpowering because you have some very beautiful, like delicate colors. Like you have this pink, and there's these little outlines, and this is a pretty muted, like purpley lilac color. And the yellow is saturated, but yellow is a very light color. I feel like it's hard to push past the red and look at some of the other areas. If you were more intentional about the colors you were using in conjunction with each other, that would push push the piece because you have like a grayish purple. You have a purple that's on red, but because it's on such a dark red, it looks gray. I could see this going like so far, like it's a great like repeating shape. It has that tessellation quality to it. So you could repeat this on like an entire like skein of cloth or something. And it would be really beautiful. It would be great on a piece of fabric. Fabric feels like it's breathing in a way that paper does not. I feel like the paper is very opaque and very straight and to the point. You don't have very crisp, rigid lines, which I think is more typical of a silk screen, but I think you could get that to work to your advantage if you had a rougher surface. Because here on this very crisp, opaque red paper, this does feel like a technical mistake. Whereas if it was on a coarser surface, or even if it was something like rice paper, which has a little bit of texture to it, I think could be very beautiful. So just think about the surface, because I think especially with printmaking, there's a real opportunity to do it on like 10 different kinds of paper and you don't ruin the print in the process. If this was a jewelry design, or like some sort of bracelet, I think that would, that would be like really beautiful. Yeah. Do you guys see like sculptural potential yes. 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 in this design? Yeah, I think it would be really nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have you thought about that? Like creating it as a sculptural piece? Or? I No, I haven't. Because my issue with the color is that the color just feels arbitrary. It doesn't seem like there was a plan, but it's not chaotic enough for us to say, oh, they're just doing whatever. It's like in this awkward place where it's almost organized, but not quite. And I just want you to like push it in one direction. One is not better than the other. It's just whichever way you want to put it in. What about the arrangements? Because here we have a print that's been repeated three times. And here, they come right up against each other. Here, there's a little bit of an overlap. What do you guys think about that? Like, it would show a repetitive pattern, but the yellow one actually is upside down compared to the oh. designs on the set two up one. Is it? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Which, I don't know if oh. it was an intentional or not, but that's also something to keep in mind, like, because you have two patterns that are the same in terms of orientation, and then that one is flipped. It feels like the yellow one was placed in so that it would fit on the paper. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Something that's also interesting about this is it makes me think of a compass. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting because it's a sigil, it's about energy that you want in your life. It's kind of like a compass for the energy that you want in your life. I'm a bit confused as to why you chose this one to be critiqued if it's meant for you. You have to think a little bit more about the context. I mean, I think it's hard to do when you're a student and you're in a class and everything, because when you start working professionally, it's like if you're doing public art, you meet the mayor and all these committee people who get to judge your artwork. Um, and it, it's a whole other audience. I wonder if maybe you could get more playful with this and have it like rotate or maybe go around like this. It, it's very rigid the way that it's set up. Or even if you want to really push the rigidity, have them lined up in a row very perfectly. So it, it seems very formal. Th this is almost formal, but not quite. 
And I do like this connection better than this one, because to me, this one just looks a little sloppy because I'm having trouble seeing the design. This one, it's like they fit each other so beautifully. And so I really believe that relationship that's going on in there. But I'll tell you, I, I do really like the story behind this because I feel like I see a lot of designs that are just like, yeah, shape. <laughs> like, I don't know if you guys have seen, there's, I forget what the company is called, but it's something technology. And it's just this like swirl. And I'm like, oh my God, how much did they pay? Some advertising company to come up with a swirl. And so even though we may not immediately look at this and say, oh, love and protection, yes. What I do like about it is that you had intent. And I think intent really matters because, I don't know, it just seems like the internet has spawned this whole genre of eye candy that is like 10 times worse than anything that ever existed. And you just see so many artists where they're like, I saved my belly button lint for 20 years and I needed a sweater out of it. It's, just like really, it's all about like this compulsivity and it, it's so like, oh. So anyway. The, the point is that you have a very personal story to tell here. Is that sallow blue? No. <laughs> Don't pay attention to me. Pay attention to the art. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna fail all of you. <laughs>